we have finished with the intrinsic mechanisms for the regulation of GFR. That's the thing that I want to remind you about. So remember we were... Is that it? No? No, I don't want to broadcast slideshow. I just want to show it. Um, we figured out that intrinsic controls basically responsible for the maintenance of GFR as it is. Because constant GFR is sort of a, a what defines a kidney function. And I think did we did we did we figure out what's going on when if GFR, if glomerular filtration rate decreases say dramatically, how does it affect kidney function? It decrease yeah, so so filtration decreases, right? Which means we cannot get rid of all the stuff that we're supposed to get rid of. And if GFR for some reason dramatically increases, then we start to do what? Huh? Yeah, and we start to lose stuff in the urine. Does that make sense? Because, you know, reabsorption, we'll talk about reabsorption, you will see that there's limited capacity to it. So we figure that there are two main mechanisms. One of them is myogenic, which is pretty basic. Come on. There we go. Myogenic, which is just pretty basic when um, blood pressure increases, GFR increases, you constrict the arteriole that feeds the glomerulus, meaning afferent. Then you dilate the arteriole that drains the glomerulus, meaning efferent, and vice versa. Okay. Now, for uh, the tubular glomerular mechanism it's slightly different so you've got to have macula denser cells they send sodium chloride concentrations when GFR goes up amount of filtrate goes up um, filtrate starts to flow faster so reabsorption time decreases less sodium chloride is reabsorbed its concentration as a consequence goes up in the filtrate macula densa cells, they sense that elevated sodium chloride concentration, they squeeze the afferent arterial, and vice versa. It's all like, you know, one or another. Now, that was intrinsic. I don't think we actually got to extrinsic. And this is, I'm really proud of this flow chart, which looks absolutely horrendous. It, it does, right? Now, you know what, what's funny about this chart? You know 90% of it already. Because it was cardiovascular. When we talked about cardiovascular system, we talked about blood pressure regulation. Okay? Now, when blood pressure goes up, realistically speaking, like, blood pressure increases, what is the renal mechanism to reduce it. What is the renal mechanism to reduce the blood pressure? It's basically only one. When blood pressure goes up, what happens to GFR? Hmm? It goes up. What happens to amount of urine that is produced? Goes up. What happens to blood volume? Goes back down. Blood volume goes back down. Blood pressure goes back down. Does that make sense? Now, if we hypothetically imagine a human which lives in sort of a paradise, well, again, it's going to be a lousy paradise, but let's say, how to say, people are not supposed to develop high blood pressure. High blood pressure is the consequence of lifestyle choices. We would be hunters and gatherers. We wouldn't develop high blood pressure. We would exercise all the time. What we would develop is actually low blood pressure. If we would get injured, does that make sense? We get injured. We lose blood, our blood pressure drops. We hunters and gatherers, we just, we just wrestle the bear. 
We got injured, we lost two pints of blood. Okay, blood pressure is down. What are going to be the responses? There are a few of them. First and foremost, of course, activation of sympathetic system. Okay, so sympathetic activation immediately leads to norepinephrine and epinephrine production. Norepinephrine is a direct neuromediator of sympathetic system. Now, uh, epinephrine, as you remember, is produced by adrenal medulla. So far, are we clear about it? So they both, what do they do? They vasoconstrict overall. That's kind of increases blood pressure right away. Does that make sense? And since it's vasoconstriction, afferent arteriol is a blood vessel. It constricts blood flow through the glomerulus, decreases amount of urine down blood volume immediately goes up so blood pressure is restored are we clear about it sympathetic system will also stimulate juxtaglomerular cells okay granular cells now juxtaglomerular juxtaglomerular cells will produce renin now two main stimuli for renin release, actually, two main stimuli is reduced stretch. Why? So think about this: blood pressure drops. Let me go back for a second. Oh, here, here. When blood pressure drops, what happens to the stretch of the afferent arterial? Hmm? It it goes. When blood, systemically, blood pressure decreases. So pressure in the afferent arteriole is lower, so it's not as stretched. Does that make sense? In response to this, granular cells can release renin. Or they can release renin as the result of systemic sympathetic activation. That makes sense here. So the two options: mechanical stimulation from you know reduced stretch, reduced blood pressure means reduced stretch, or symp sympathetic stimulation. Now renin will stimulate conversion of angiotensinogen into the angiotensin one. Angiotensin one will Catalyze will, will be converted in angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 will stimulate um, the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone, as you remember, it increases the retention of sodium in the kidneys. Sodium is retained. Water is retained. Blood volume increases. Blood pressure increases. Does that make sense? Now, <clears throat> blood pressure, reduced blood pressure by itself, can directly stimulate kidneys to produce adenosine and prostaglandin E2, BGE2. Both these chemicals directly increase basic constriction. Just directly. Does that make sense? And finally, think about this. Blood pressure goes down. How does it affect JFR? It goes down. So amount of filtrate that is formed when you say lose two pints of blood happens to the amount of filtrate that is produced by the kidneys. It goes down. So less filtrate produced how does it affect the reabsorption time? It increases, right? Do you understand? Because since you produce less filtrate, it has more time physically to go through the uh, convoluted tubules, the whole system, right? So reabsorption time increases, reabsorption of sodium chloride increases, 
sodium chloride concentration decreases, macular denser cells sense it, directly stimulate juxtaglomerular cells to produce renin. Does that make sense? So, I, the reason why it looks horrendous is that there are all those pathways that we discussed merged together. But we just discerned it. So there's pathway, basically pathway number one, sympathetic, right? Sympathetic system. Just sympathetic activation with all its downstream effects. Pathway number two, we can put, that's juxtaglomerular cells. Okay, and we can say pathway number three is direct kidney stimulation. Now, of course, you know, you can break down each pathway farther. You can say sympathetic stimulation, which effects does it have on kidneys? Afferent arterial constriction, one. Renin release, two. How juxtaglomerular cells get activated? They can get activated by C. They can get activated directly by reduced stretch, or they can get activated by macula densa cells sensing low sodium chloride. Does that make sense? So, you know, I, I don't remember if I told you this, but how we eat an elephant piece by piece. So, you basically break the huge concept down into smaller bits and you understand each individual bit. Reductionist approach. Any questions? Now, this will be a, a piece on the exam when I'm going to be asking you about physiological responses. You may expect, and I will give you quizzes today that will address this issue. I will give you a question something like, when blood pressure increases, and I will make certain that we're talking about extrinsic response, when blood pressure dramatically increases, okay? And then you have a variety of answers, and you have to figure out what happens. GFR increases? Yes. So you eliminate everything that says GFR decreases. So, okay, if GFR increases, um, how does it affect blood volume, okay, or filtrate formation, stuff like that. Am I clear? So what I love about this part, it's logical. You can just deduce what, what's going on next. Are we clear? Now, I love this, this, this thing here. We're going to talk how kidneys reabsorb stuff. So the majority of reabsorption, the majority, I want to highlight, majority, happens in proximal convoluted tube. Not necessarily all of it, but the majority happens in PCT. There are parts of reabsorptive processes that occur in the nephron loop. And some may happen even in the distal convoluted tube. We're clear. So I will not ask you, you know, I can't really ask you which of the following parts of nephron is responsible, solely responsible for reabsorption, because none of them is solely responsible. What you have to understand, though, is that reabsorption happens only in the tubular system. It's not in the glomerulus. Does that make sense? Glomerulus is the place for filtration. Tubular system, the place for reabsorption and place for secretion. We're clear. How things, in general, what, I'm trying to think how to ask you 
what is being reabsorbed? What is reabsorbed from the filtrate? More specific, what is in the filtrate, first and foremost? The, the biggest component of filtrate is what? Water. Water is reabsorbed. We go from 180 liters of filtrate to one and a half liters of urine, right? What else is reabsorbed? Ions. Various ions are reabsorbed. Good. What else? That's basically ions. Sodium, chloride, calcium. What else? I was about to ask, are any proteins reabsorbed? Huh? Are there any proteins reabsorbed? Why? Because they're not there in the first place. We do not. We do not filter. We're talking about normal situation. Proteins aren't in the filtrate in the first place. There's nothing to reabsorb. What is in the filtrate that we want back? And if we find it in the urine, that's the red flag. Huh? Sugar. Generally speaking, small organics. Glucose, amino acids, basically. Does that make sense? Now, how all these chemicals, what, which physical process will drive all those chemicals? Osmosis can absorb water, and it will, yes. Osmosis will. What about ions? Chemicals. How they usually, what usually moves them from one side to another side? Huh? Concentration gradient, which means D word diffusion, or if you need to actually concentrate them, active transport. Does that make sense? So what essentially we're going to focus on now are the mechanisms of reabsorption of chemicals via diffusion or active transport or osmosis, which basically is uh, water diffusion. We clear so far. Now, look at this picture here. So this yellow stuff here is the filtrate. This is blood. During reabsorption, you have to move chemicals and water, or well, water is a chemical, from filtrate to blood. Do I make sense? Are we clear about it? As you can see in this picture, you know, there's epithelium on the way. It's a cuboidal epithelium in the convoluted tubules. So there are two simple cuboidal, so one layer, simple cuboidal epithelium. There are two options, as you can see. Option number one, two, three, four, lined up here is transcellular root. Can you see that? So let's let's trace down what's going on during transcellular root. So we have a hypothetical chemical in the filtrate. What does it have to cross first? I'm asking simple questions. You know the answers. Cell membrane, which side of the cell do you remember? Epithelium is two sides, apical side. So it crosses apical side, then it has to cross cytoplasm first, right? Then basal membrane. And then it's, it's basically there, because if it's in the extracellular fluid, it will be in the blood. That makes sense. So we've got apical membrane, Cytoplasm, base, basal membrane, or basolateral membrane often. That's called transcellular root. So you see it can cross the, the basal or lateral. That's why we generally 
refer to this membrane as basolateral. So far, do you follow me? Or chemicals can pass between the cells. If the junctions here aren't incredibly tight, <laughs> and they aren't really, so chemicals can pass between the cells. So which chemicals, again, are we talking about? Sodium, ions, glucose, amino acids. Can they get across the membrane directly? If they diffuse, can they diffuse across the membrane directly? No. Why? They are, of course, they're hydrophilic. They filtrate is water, mostly. They're all there, so they're hydrophilic, right? So in order to get across the membrane, what do they need? Huh? No, 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 no. What allows them through the membrane? Generally, generalize. Trans. Huh? Transport protein of some sort. It can be a channel, it can be a carrier, or if it's not diffusion and it's active transport, it got to be a pump. We're clear about it. So they must have something. Now, which route here, transcellular or paracellular, will have to employ transport proteins? Transcellular. Do you understand why? In paracellular, there are no membranes to cross. Now I'm going to ask, it's not a hard question, but you have to think about the answer. Which route can use only diffusion? Paracellular. Why? It's not crossing the membrane. Now, why it cannot use active transport? What do we need for active transport? A pump. Is there any place in paracellular route to put a pump? It cannot pump cannot just float. You know? Does that make sense? So paracellular route will be always diffusion. So this is always diffusion. Does that make sense? Transcellular can be both, and we'll talk about it. It's super elegant. So to figure out how it works, let's take a glance in the left bottom corner. Okay, there's a lot of things drawn here. Can you see the, the, the image? Because if not, I can bring up like a, a big white screen and try to draw there. But so far, let's work our way through the through the picture. First and foremost, the main working horse of kidney transport is sodium potassium pump. Which membrane is that? Basal or apical? Basal. So sodium is pumped where? From to Sodium is pumped from from the cell to the huh to the yeah ECF blood. Let's call it blood. Agree? It's not directly to the blood, but eventually. So potassium is pumped back into the cell. Yeah. So what about the concentrations? The sodium concentration is low where inside the cell. Forget about potassium so far. Let's talk about sodium, okay? So sodium, intracellular sodium is low, okay? Now, I want you to understand, like, appreciate that sodium-potassium pump constantly uses energy. Energy. ATP. 
to maintain sodium concentration in the cell low. Not just low, sodium concentration in the cell is lower, and we're talking about, this is, this is the epithelial cell of, of, a, of a renal tube, okay? So intracellular sodium is low, lower than sodium in the filtrate. So sodium in the filtrate will do what? It will diffuse into the cell. What's going to happen to the sodium? Imagine that there's like a, a bunch of sodium ions that diffused into the cell. What's going to happen to them right away? They're going to get, they're going to be pumped. Does that make sense? So we have, <clears throat> sorry, we have active transport, primary active transport on the basal side and diffusion on the apical side. That's for sodium. Do follow. You good? Okay, awesome. What about water? Remember, water just follows sodium. We call this process osmosis, right? So essentially, there are channels, aquaporins, essentially, constitutively expressed. They, they present in the apical membrane. As sodium gets into the cell, water gets into the cell. That's it. Does that make sense? Now, do we need a reminder about secondary active transport? Very quick, very dirty. Do one? Good. So, this is diffusion from high to low, right? This is active transport from low to high. So you know, diffusion, and it's primary active transport. So what primary active transport needs? ATP, ATP energy, yes? Now, secondary active transport, <laughs> technically, we can picture it this way. So we have one chemical that diffuses, and when it diffuses, it actually releases kinetic energy. Now this kinetic energy is used by another chemical to be transported against the gradient. Does that make sense? So this is secondary active transport. It looks perfect. It, it looks like the, the perpetuum mobile, like the process that doesn't require any energy input. What's the catch? Where do we need to put energy in? Where in this in this in this picture? Where is energy consuming part? Huh? No, no, no. The second molecule. Yeah, but. It looks like we just take energy out of nowhere. Does that make sense? That we just constantly have a diffusion, right? What is the, if you have a gradient of concentrations, if you have high concentration in one side of the membrane and low concentration in another side of the membrane, and the molecule starts to diffuse, what's going to happen to concentrations eventually? They're going to be equal. So, what are we using energy for? To get the molecule out from whatever side of the membrane we need, right? To maintain the gradient. Essentially, what we do, we use ATP here, okay? To keep this ATP, to keep it low. Are we clear about it? Does that make sense? So let's go back to what we've discussed. We use ATP to keep sodium concentration inside of the cell low, so sodium can diffuse into the cell constantly. Now the diffusion of sodium will provide energy for active transport 
of other molecules inside the cell. Does that make sense? Essentially, molecules will be transported in what, what's called co-transporter or antiporter. Let's take a glance at this again. First of all, now let's start with glucose. It's pretty elegant. You have glucose co-transporter. Can you see that? Sodium here gets inside the cell and brings glucose with it. That makes sense? Because normally glucose concentration inside of the cell is very high. Okay? Amino acids, same. Calcium, same. Co-transporter. Chloride is the same. Phosphate, the same. That makes sense so far. So every time sodium flows in, something else flows in. Now you may have noticed that in all those cases, we have hydrogen being removed from the cell. What is the normal pH of urine? Slightly acidic. Slightly acidic. Can you die of acidosis? Yes, you can. Okay, so um, you got to get rid of hydrogens all the time. That's normal process to excrete hydrogens in the urine. Does that make sense? So, um, like if you are on high protein diet, your metabolic profile will sh shift towards higher acid production due to the protein metabolism and the acid metabolism, you will need to excrete those hydrogens. So with every opportunity, as you can see, every transporter, sodium will use energy to pump hydrogen ions out. Does that make sense? So far, do you understand? I want you really to understand the idea of secondary active transport so essentially think about this we have this primary active transport on the basolateral surface okay that drives sodium diffusion on the apical surface but sodium diffusion in this case is the part of a bigger picture that is secondary active transport to bring in glucose, amino acids, different ions, and so on and so forth. Are we clear about it? We're good? Understood? Awesome. Um, now I'm going to ask you another question. Let's go back here. Sodium is being reabsorbed by diffusion, right? Water follow sodium due to the osmosis. When water leaves filtrate and goes into the blood, how does it affect the concentration of everything else in the filtrate? It increases. And for some of the ions and chemicals, that increase may be so dramatic that they will simply use paracellular route to diffuse directly into the extracellular fluid. Does that make sense? Basically, water reabsorption concentrates the filtrate and enable, enables the, the diffusion, the passive transport of all those chemicals from the filtrate into the blood. Does that make sense? Now, I do not require you to memorize names of all like co-transporters, anti-porters, and blah, 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 blah. But I do want you to understand the mechanism. 
with sodium potassium pump on the basolateral side and sodium diffusion being a main driving force for the reabsorption on the apical side. Am I clear? Now one important thing about reabsorption really is really clinically relevant. It's the concept of transport maximum. Imagine that you have um, a football field. So you line your entire high school. I don't know, maybe it's too bold of me to ask to line up the entire high school. Let's say you know, a thousand people, which is actually much less than you think. You line up thousand people along the you know the, the longer side. Basically the hundred yard side, okay? And you tell them to walk or run, jog to another side of the field. Shouldn't be a problem, should it? They're gonna make I mean basically they're gonna move there um, with a speed that they jog, correct? Now imagine that in the middle of a field along it you install a wall with two doors and th this thousand people they cannot go around the wall they have to go through the doors it'll take them a lot of time to get through those doors does that make sense because each door has a certain limit of people that it can let through in a given period of time am i clear every transport protein whether it's a carrier or a channel, or a pump, or a SIM porter, or a tie porter. Every of those proteins has its own transport maximum. Which means, at some point, it reaches the maximum transport capacity. Do you understand? that make sense okay they probably I can probably come up with some other analogy about the diameter of a pipe and you start to pour water in it and if you pour just a little bit then it's not a problem it's all gonna go through the pipe but if you start to pour a lot then you will have water accumulating at upper end of a pipe because not all of it can go down in a, in a given minute does that make sense so how is this important in the clinical terms? Look at this graph. Um, a little digression. What are two skills that nursing program here at Lakeland considers to be most important skills in new nursing students to know? One of them is use microscope. And another one is to read graphs, understand what they reflect. So that's why I give you so many graphs here, so you comfortable with them. I'm not kidding. We asked, we asked instructors, nursing, what they think is most important, and they thought long, long and hard, and they told us, you know, graphs. So this is the glucose concentration in plasma. Okay, on the y on the x-axis. This is the glucose concentration in the filtrate. Okay, does that make sense? Now, actually, y-axis reflects how much is filtered, how much is reabsorbed, or how much is excreted, and I will break it down for you. Okay, but basically, y-axis here refers to kidneys. So far, do you follow? Essentially, this plasma glucose concentration, if I was fasting overnight, what is my plasma glucose concentration? Around 100. 9,500 milligrams per mil, that's, that's normal. Okay? 
Now, if I ate a chocolate bar, what's going to happen to my plasma glucose right away? It's going to increase. If I ate three massive carrot cakes, it's going to like spike, right? Make sense? Or say I just drank like two liters of concentrated glucose solution. Basically, I gave myself uh, a, a glucose challenge. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it on YouTube, you know, don't start. They have pot challenge, that type pot challenge, that's enough. Basically, what happens if your glucose is elevated normally as it would after the meal? As it goes up, like here, okay? All of it, first of all, so look at the red line. All of it get filtered. All of the glucose get filtered. And what's important, look at the red, uh, blue line. All of it gets reabsorbed back. <coughs> so when you throw away all glucose and reabsorb all glucose, what do you have left in the urine? You throw away everything and then reabsorb everything. Nothing. Does that make sense? You have nothing. You have zero. So far, follow me. Now imagine I eat three giant, massive carrot cakes with a lot of sugar in them. So my glucose in the blood spikes to 500. Let's look at the filtration. First of all, um, all of this glucose, everything that I have in the blood, will end up in the filtrate. Does that make sense? So that's 600, 600 and a change. This is how much I have in the filtrate. Does that make sense? Now remember, glucose is reabsorbed. Do follow, Alex. I just want to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. Now, glucose gets reabsorbed by the transport protein <clears throat> and this transport protein is a transport maximum which is reached at the glucose concentration of about you know almost 400 does that make sense which means when your blood glucose reaches for surely not even 400 it's technically Two hundred twenty. Okay, so your new blood glucose reaches two hundred twenty. Concentration of glucose is also two hundred, whatever, three hundred. Okay, it's kind of a lousy representation, but you get the gist, right? So your blood glucose reaches a certain level, your filtrate concentration reaches the same level, but the problem is, not all of it can get reabsorbed. Because protein has a transport maximum. Does it, do you understand? So it doesn't matter how much glucose you have in the filtrate. The transport capacity of a protein reaches its max. Using same analogy with the doors. This is the door. If I will put one person in front of the door. Just one, not just one person. How many people can walk through that door in a minute? One. If I put two. If I put 156 people, how many people can walk through the door in a minute? Well, definitely not 156, right? It's like limited capacity. Does that make sense? So this door has certain transport maximum. And it doesn't matter if I put on this side 100, 2, 3 million people. It will let people through with a certain maximum rate. Does that make sense? So, in terms of the transport maximum, at some point, it doesn't matter which concentration you have in the filtrate. Your kidneys will reabsorb only so much. 
Does that make sense? Okay. So you will see that much being reabsorbed and this much being excreted. So all glucose that cannot be reabsorbed will be released in the urine. Does that make sense? So essentially people who are diabetic and have really high blood glucose levels, the kidneys cannot possibly reabsorb all that glucose. And maybe for good, they get rid of that glucose in the urine. Does that make sense? So what was the old, yes? Um, so one of the another possible mechanism so one of them probably yes uh, glucose will also osmotically draw the water into the filtrate just because it's also it also has certain osmolality another reason is acidosis in acidosis the amount of urine will be increased to get rid of it get rid of uh, hydrogen ions as you may know, the old test for diabetes was what? Huh? Let's not go that far. <laughs> First of all, yes, it was tasting urine, yes. But also putting it out to, to, to see the uh, amount of flies. Flies like sweet urine. But yeah, we had a, a really good joke about medical students when the first lecture in the medical school uh, lecturer says that the true doctor uh, has to have two qualities. First of all, doctor has to be really, really attentive. And second, good doctor must not be disgusted by anything. He says, look, um, this is the uh, like a, a can of urine. So I'm going to try it and he dips his finger in the in the urine and licks it. And everybody, you know, all the audience is amazed, like, oh. And he says, well, can anyone repeat that? And, you know, one student, you know, this really, like, very, I don't, I don't forgot that expression that my kids told, They're like, always try to do what the professor does, jumps up, you know, runs to the can of urine and dips the finger, licks it. And the professor says, well, you definitely not easily disgusted by anything. You're also not really attentive because you didn't notice that I dipped my index finger and I licked my middle one. So, um, but it was a test in the olden times. It actually tastes sweet, urine of diabetic patients. Um, usually, this happens. Um, in patients with diabetes. It can happen with drugs. Well, we'll talk about uh, renal clearance. When, especially when you take penicillin, it has practically zero reabsorption or penicillin derivatives. A lot of drugs have zero reabsorption, so they'll pass with the urine. Basically, the transport maximum is close to zero. Does that make sense? You know, you know So they're all filtered. The transport maximum is close to zero. So practically all of them are excreted in the urine. Does that make sense? I want to make a really, really clear distinction between excretion and secretion in terms. And I try to use them very carefully. Generally, when we talk about renal secretion, we refer to a very specific process very specific, that occurs mainly in the distal convoluted tubules, that is often tightly regulated, say by hormones. Does that make sense? Like it, stim it induces some active transport system. Does that make sense? <coughs> when we say excretion, we generally refer to the process of getting rid of something. So I say, we excrete potassium with urine. We don't distinguish mechanisms by which we do that. We just, just dump it out. 
Does that make sense? Question? No? Good. Does that make, do you understand the idea? Secretion is much more specific. Okay? So, there we go. This scheme on the right shows you the main sites for reabsorption and secretion. So, blue is reabsorption. Okay, so you can say reabsorption. You can see reabsorption happens all over. The majority of it happens in a proximal convoluted tubule. Some really important happens in the nephron loop, and some in the distal convoluted tubule. Secretion, again, happens basically everywhere. Okay. But this is what I'm talking about when I tell you distinguish secretion and excretion. Regulated secretion, potassium bile dustral. Do you see that? Regulated secretion, potassium bile dustral. Now, this, this is secretion of hydrogen and ammonia. This is the regulation of blood pH. Uh, which happens, as you remember, via the seam porter and tie porter mechanism. Now we're gonna. The deal is, I am going to tell you about mechanisms of secretion that I want you to know, very specifically. Does that make sense here? So you don't need to memorize enormous number of different where it happens i will be very specific what you need to know so far i really want you to focus on the general mechanisms of reabsorption understand what transport maximum is understand what happens when concentration of a chemical in the filtrate is above transport maximum it's basically being excreted with urine does that make sense So this is this is this is tough. <laughs> this is the regulation. Um, it's a regulation of urine concentration. Before we start all that all that crap, why do we need to regulate concentra concentration of urine? What's essentially the purpose? To get rid of what? Or to save what? When do we produce concentrated urine? When we dehydrate. When we overhydrate it, we produce diluted urine. Does that make sense? So essentially, what we're going to talk about now is the process that regulates water balance. Okay? Good? Now, this whole process is driven by osmosis. And for this, we need to recall what osmolality is. Osmolality, and I have really, I basically just found out, I have a really embarrassing mistake here. It shouldn't affect us. Osmolality is the number of solute particles in one liter, not kilogram. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask the exact definition. So it's a number of solute particle in the liter. Okay? Molarity is the number <coughs> in one kilo. Osmolality is usually measured in milli osmoles. That makes sense. No? Does it? Are you familiar with a unit called mole? What does it measure? Usually it's a question that stops. What does it measure? 
mole. One mole of sodium chloride. What does that mean? One mole of sodium chloride. Say again? Six point by ten, ten in the power of twenty three of what? Molecules of sodium chloride. Can you have a mole? So I usually ask this question Can you have a mole of dollars? Yeah, yeah, it's a number. Mole is the number. That makes sense. It's a huge number, but it's a number. So when we say mole, we can say one mole of glucose means 6.022 by 10 to the power of 23 molecules of glucose. When we say osmo, this is a number of individual particles. Here's the big difference. I'm not going to ask you on about this on the exam but I want you to understand sodium chloride what happens to it in the water solution if you add salt to water what happens to the salt it dissolves as it dissolves molecule dissociates into the sodium cation and chloride anion so one molecule of sodium chloride gives you how many particles two so one mole of sodium chloride will give you two osmoles in the solution. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? So we're talking about particles here. It can be urea, it can be sodium, it can be potassium. But the main contributor in the regulation of water balance here is sodium chloride okay so plasma is a pretty standard osmolality which doesn't change much it's about 300 milliosmoles okay so it's pretty pretty standard now osmolality of and it can maintain its osmolality because of the regulation by kidneys. If osmolality of plasma increases, what does that mean? Osmolality of plasma increases. Which state you're in? Are you dehydrated or overhydrated? Dehydrated. Concentration goes up because water content goes down. Does that make sense? Now, if you overhydrated osmolality of plasma, will go down. It's going to be diluted. That makes sense here. Are we clear about that? So now when osmolality of plasma decreases, we produce a lot of diluted urine to get rid of water. Osmolality of plasma increases, we have to concentrate urine to save water. Right. <clears throat> it's all done by counter current multiplier mechanism. And juxtamedullary nephrons are responsible here. The main element of juxtamedullary nephron that is responsible for it is the nephron loop, loop of Henle. Now remember, with juxtamedullary, next to medulla. So if you would look at this image, you'll notice that nephron loop is actually immersed in the medulla. Everything else is in the cortex, but the loop is in the medulla. So far. Good? So essentially, what happens? So, um, loop, the nephron loop, is called countercurrent multiplier. When filtrate here enters the nephron loop, it has uh, the osmolality of about 300. When it reaches 
the bottom of the nephron loop, it has an osmolality of 1200. So it gets concentrated. And as it gets up here, its osmolality decreases again to about 100 at this point. We'll, we'll talk how it all happens. Don't worry. Just So basically what happens when filtrate goes through the nephron loop of juxtamedullary nephron, water is being sucked out of it. Okay? Water and electrolytes, mainly sodium chloride. Now, the question is, where does it all go? Water and electrolytes go into the vasa recta. Remember those blood vessels around the nephron loop of juxtamedullary? There we go. So you see vasa recta? Can you see that? So... Water and electrolytes that leave the nephron loop end up in the blood flow, in the vasorecta. And vasorecta carries them away. Does that make sense? Um, do you know what heat exchanger is? Did you ever see heat exchangers? Cooling things like cooling heat exchangers. Basically, they, have you ever tried to prepare moonshine in the laboratory conditions? You know, distill some alcohol in the lab conditions. You evaporate alcohol and then you condense it in exchanger, heat exchanger, which is the pipe inside of another pipe. And outside of the inner pipe, there is water running that's important it's running it takes away the heat does that make sense so vasorecta here is counter current exchanger why it is called counter current because the directions of the flow in vasorecta and nephron loop are opposite does that make sense I'm sorry. That makes sense? So like imagine like I'm going this direction, Nicole goes in opposite direction, and I'm giving something to her. So counter current we go in opposite directions and we exchange. I give something that I don't need there, but she needs over there. To get it. Right? We're clear? Now, what is going on there? Let's talk about nephron loop first. It's actually fairly simple and um, we just use, we will, we're going to use reductionist approach. We're going to talk about different parts without addressing others. You know, we're going to do it like step by step. Okay. So let's talk about nephron loop first. Let's start with the glomerulus. So, um, osmolality of plasma is about 300. So, osmolality of filtrate, since everything is filtered, is also 300. Are we clear? So, this 300 enter at this point. That makes sense. Interestingly enough, extracellular fluid in the medulla also has a gradient of osmolality. Medulla, like if you go from cortex deep into the medulla, 
you will see the increase of osmolality of extracellular fluid from 300 to 1200. Does that make sense? So far. I mean, we're not asking why. Okay, I'm telling you that's what we observe. We'll try to figure out how it happens, how it is being maintained. But so far, just take it. This is what is seen in the medulla. Osmolality of the medullar interst interstitial fluid goes from 300 near cortex to 1200 in the inner medulla. Does that make sense? So as this 300 enter the nephron loop, when they appear in the area where osmolality on this side is, say, 320. Higher osmolality means higher con concentration. Now, water goes from high to low concentrations of water or low to high concentrations of solutes, right? Water will always be driven to the areas with the high concentrations of solutes. Do I make sense? So in the descending limb, this is called descending limb of the nephron loop, water starts to leave the filtrate. Do you understand why? I want to be very sure that we all understand why it happens. Water leaves nephron loop the descending limb of nephron loop because concentration or smolality of interstitial fluid in the medulla is slightly higher than osmolality of the filtrate. Does that make sense? And it's constantly slightly higher. Got it? Two things that happen to filtrate as water leaves leaves it. First of all, what happens to the filtrate osmolality when water goes away? It increases. And you can see it here, osmolality increases from 300 to essentially 1200. Does that make sense? What happens to the volume of the filtrate? Decreases. Everybody understands that. So this is how you go from 180 liters to one and a half. Does that make sense? Good. Why only water? This is like a stupid question which does have an answer. Why only water leaves the descending limb? Why sodium chloride cannot, I don't know, diffuse or something? It's like incredibly stupid and simple answer. What does it need to leave? Can it just go through the membrane? It needs what? A pump or, you know, carry something like a protein. Why it cannot leave? There aren't any. That's it. There aren't any channels or carriers for sodium to move. That's it. This is pretty cool. Okay? There are no pumps, nothing. Okay? It does not leave the filtrate in the descending limb. We clear? Now, in the ascending limb, the situation is flipped. There are no water channels. So water here cannot leave. Does that make sense? But sodium chloride can. There's a little bit where it is diffusing, the majority of it, it is being pumped out of the filtrate into the medullary interstitial fluid. Does that make sense? As you pump sodium chloride or move sodium chloride out of the filtrate, what happens to the filtrate osmolality? Decreases, right? 
it goes kind of back down. What happens to the filtrate volume? You move, you, it decreases. It, it doesn't decrease that much, but it does decrease. So what you end up with here in the distal convoluted tubule is very, 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 very diluted filtrate. You see 100 milliosmoles. It's more diluted than it was when it entered. But it's diluted in the interesting way. It's not diluted by water addition. It's diluted by pumping sodium chloride out. Does that make sense? That's pretty, pretty remarkable, even. Okay, do you follow me here? So, basically, when filtrate passes through the nephron loop of juxtamedullary nephron, it loses water and sodium chloride, which significantly decreases its its volume okay now i'm going to talk about vasorecta separately i want to kind of continue so that really diluted part here after distal convoluted tubule enters collecting duct now here's the deal i, I find this whole mechanism incredibly elegant because here's the deal. When you are dehydrated, no, okay. Yeah, when you are dehydrated, which hypothalamic hormone is released from pituitary gland? Hmm? ADH, antidiuretic hormone, right? Which makes you pee less. The actual mechanism for ADH, it increases the number of aquaporins channels for water in the collecting ducts. That makes sense. Now, what is the concentration of filtrate? here as it leaves distal convoluted tube and enters collecting duct what is the concentration tell me the number 100 what is the concentration of what is the osmolality of interstitial fluid in the medulla 300 if there are channels for water. Water will osmotically diffuse from filtrate into the surrounding interstitial fluid. Does that make sense? I find it incredibly elegant. Now, if you are, and as water diffuses from that filtrate, what happens to the urine concentration? It increases, right, and you produce small volume of concentrated urine. Now, if you are overhydrated, what happens to ADH levels? They go down dramatically, right? As they go down, what happens to those aquaporins? Huh? They aren't there. Water, I kind of make water sort of anthropomorphic, but water would love to go in the middle. But there is no way for it to go to the medulla because there are no aquaporins. So it stays in the collecting duct, it stays in the filtrate, and you produce large volume of diluted urine. Does that make sense? If you overhydrate it, ADH is down, right? Aquaporins are not there. All that water stays sealed. In the collecting duct and just passes through. Right? Now, the last bit about vasorecta. Uh, let's go back to that. Um, 
somewhat of an exchanger you can observe in your house in the toilet. When you use the toilet, what are you supposed to do afterwards to use it? You're supposed to flush it. Essentially, that's an exchanger. You use running water to remove the waste, right? When you when you distill something, use running running water to remove the heat to remove now if you have sodium and sodium chloride and water leaving nephron loop what's going to happen is that you will lose this gradient it will equalize eventually does that make sense Sodium chloride will be pumped right here, and it will be all equal. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sodium chloride that is pumped out of the nephron loop into the interstitial fluid will level out the gradient, and there will be no concentration of the filtrate in the nephron loop because there's no gradient. The medullary gradient is what drives this concentration. You need something to pick up water and sodium chloride and remove it. And that's the function of vasorecta. Okay? So vasorecta absorbs sodium chloride and then absorbs water since, remember, it's counter current mechanism. The direction of blood flow is essentially opposite to the direction of filtrate flow. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? If I'm a filtrate and I'm going this way and I'm dumping water and then sodium chloride and Nicole is blood and she will go another way picking up sodium chloride and then water and going into the systemic circulation. Make sense? Now one interesting thing. Look at vasorecta right here. So this is volume of blood that sort of some arbitrary volume V1 that enters vasorecta from efferent arterial. And V2 is the volume that leaves vasorecta and enters veins. Which one is bigger? V1 gets all sodium chloride and water. Does that make sense? Huh? Oh, that's, that's osmolality. That's just, well, that's not volume. No, no, no. That's the deal. It picks up all those chemicals. So the volume of blood that ends up at this edge, uh, edge end, sorry, is higher. Make sense? I think that actually brings me. So we kind of, so we're going to wrap up so far before the break. Just one thing that I completely forgot to tell you we need to go back to the picture of the nephrons now kind of want to go back to the uh, anatomy a little bit just to make sure that we covered that because it's important so glomerulus which blood vessel delivers the blood to the glomerulus Afferent vessels. Which blood vessel drains the blood from glomerulus? Efferent vessel. Blood from efferent arterial, where does it go? Vasorecta in juxtamedullary nephron or peritubular capillaries in the cortical nephron. Does that make sense? So I'm going to say peritubular capillaries, 
or vasorecta. And from these capillary beds, either vasorecta or pretubular capillaries, where does the blood go? Into the V word. The blood vessel starts with V, four letters. Vein, into the vein, right? And this vein, these veins will eventually drain the blood into the renal vein. Renal vein will deliver it to the vena cava and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? So I want you to have this really clear understanding of blood sequence. That efferent arterial brings the blood into the peritubular capillary sore of azarect. Does it make sense? Are we clear about it? Okay. Now let's <clears throat> take a break and we kind of overview the regulation of the urine concentration when we come back. Sounds good?